Good morning, and welcome to Longwood Hills Congregational Church. I'm Jim Morey, the pastor, and want to welcome you on this Sunday morning, October 11th, 2020. I'm in this sanctuary, which on a normal Sunday would be um, mostly filled with people. Behind me, the praise band would be playing, and uh, people would be singing, and those sounds of joy and hymns and praise songs would fill this place. But for the last seven months, we've not been able to join together in worship, and we're hoping that that will change very soon. So we will make you aware of that on Facebook, on our website as well, and uh, through emails. And just look forward to that time that once again we can be together worshiping and praising God, giving thanks for the wonderful blessings that we have uh, in our lives together. I hope all of you are staying safe and that you are well. And as we uh, continue our worship service, um, we lift up our thanks to God as we listen to our praise uh, presentations. Good morning. I hope everybody is having a great Sunday morning so far. Let's go ahead and sing a song this morning called Your Grace is Enough. The words are below. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. And all your people sing along. So remember your people. Remember your children. Remember your promise, oh God. And your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. Great is your love and justice, God. You use the weak to lead the strong. You lead us in the song of your salvation. And all your people sing along. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, oh God. And your grace is enough, your grace is enough, and your grace is enough for Remember your children, remember your promise, oh God. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me. Your Heaven reaching down to us Your grace is enough for me God, I sing your grace is enough And I'm covered in your love Your grace is enough 
This morning, I want to invite you into a time of prayer, and particularly in this time, we we keep in our prayers um, our president and first lady um, as they continue to uh, heal from uh, the coronavirus. Um, we pray a speedy recovery for them and, and everyone who has uh, been part of the administration that have uh, that has caught. Um, COVID-19. We certainly extend our prayers for those who have lost their lives. Um, over 211,000 of uh, our of good souls have lost their lives, and we pray for their families and their friends um, who miss them so much and who are grieving. Um, we pray for a way out of this uh, time in which we uh, may get back uh, in some way of doing uh, our normal life, whatever that is going to look like in the future. We pray for our firefighters and our first responders and our police officers and all of law enforcement as they um, protect our communities and our families through all of this. We pray for... Um, in this time, lifting up and, and loving each other, uh, finding our way through our differences and working together uh, once again as a nation. So please join with me in, in prayer. Almighty God, we uh, pause this day to lift our thanks and our praise to you. We ask you, uh, to be upon our nation with your gracious care and upon our world, upon all people who are suffering so severely of the coronavirus. We pray for those who are working so diligently on a vaccine to give them the guidance and inspiration that will lead them to a solution and that may end uh, this time of virus. We pray for those who have lost their lives and their family and friends who grieve their loss so deeply. We pray for doctors and nurses and health care givers as they um, give care to these people. As they go through the emotional ups and downs of losing some of their patients and then seeing some of their patients come back to health. We pray for their families as they await them to come home in good health. We pray for those who are suffering from the virus that they may find healing and wholeness soon through your loving care and the their caregivers. We pray for families around our nation and around the world, for children going to school and ch children learning from home. We pray that as a nation we may find a new unity that draws us together to once again be a light of the freedoms that we enjoy and that have come at such a deep cost to so many and that we honor those sacrifices by continually offering that freedom, living, securing it, sharing it with others, and working together to build our nation once again as a strong beacon of light to others around the world. Be with us, wondrous God, as we pray these things and lift them to you and certainly 
as we pray together the prayer that your Son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. I want to invite the children uh, to gather around just real quickly. And just to let you know that this morning I'm uh, out in the children's playground here at church. So as I pan around, you can see all of the uh, various things that we have in our playground that's just waiting for you all to come back and to play on. Um, we miss you here at the church very much, uh, but I want to tell you a story. Uh, it's a story that you're very familiar with. Uh, it is the story of Zacchaeus, and we know that Zacchaeus was a very short man, and so because he was not very tall, and he wanted to see Jesus when Jesus came through town, and it was like a parade, and people were lining up all around the, um, the streets and watching Jesus and his disciples walk by. Zacchaeus tried to get to the front where other short people called children were standing, but he kept getting pushed back by the other people that were there. And uh, because they didn't like him very much because he was a tax collector. And not only did did they think that he was different because of his lack of height, um, which they made fun of. They also didn't like him because he, as a tax collector, took money from them that they thought that was wrong. And he gave it to the Roman government, and it was called taxes. So on that particular day, because he could not uh, see, Jesus, he was a very smart man, and he had been smart ever since he was a little boy, which might have been another reason that some of the other people or kids didn't like him at the time and probably made fun of him because he was very smart, and he might have been the first to answer the question when the teacher would ask. So he was pretty used to being made fun of, picked on. And I guess today you would say he was probably bullied. And on that particular day, he was bullied again because they just pushed him aside and they wouldn't let him stand with their children. So being very smart, he decided that he would find a tree. And it's called a sycamore tree. And there's a song about that that many of you know. I would sing it, but I know that you would turn your computers off if I did that. So he ran and he climbed the tree. So let's get 
kind of an idea. I'm going to climb up this apparatus here. This could be dangerous. I don't know. I think I can do it. Well, maybe I can't. Well, all right, this is how we're going to do it. I'm going to come over here. And he climbed that tree. Just like I'm climbing this <laughs> apparatus right now. Let's see if I can get my computer through. Oh, okay. This is uh, one of those action shots. <gasps> oh, spider webs. I hope I don't see any big spiders because then I'm going to run. I don't like big spiders. So here he is up in the tree and he's way above everybody else. Can you see all the playground around? He's way above everyone else. And he gets a clear line of sight to Jesus. And when Jesus comes by, Zacchaeus is so startled. He'd never met Jesus before. But Jesus stops right beneath the tree where Zacchaeus had climbed. Jesus not only stopped, but he looked up. And he made eye contact with Zacchaeus. And he said, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus must have been almost scared. He knows my name. I've never met Jesus. How does he know my name? And he said, Zacchaeus, come down from the tree. I need to go to your house and have dinner. Do you know, maybe you do, how that felt? Zacchaeus, who had been pushed aside by other kids all his life, made fun of. Zacchaeus, who was always outside, never included in the games, never included in any of their gatherings, didn't have any sense of belonging. Zacchaeus, who was always different and never embraced, for the first time, maybe in his life, aside from his parents, Zacchaeus felt love. And when Jesus called him by name and said, I'm coming to your house, what an honor that was for Zacchaeus. And he scurried down that tree. And with just that acceptance filling his heart from Jesus, he announced that he would make everything right. He would pay back anything that he took that was too much, and he would make everything right again. All because of God's love. Now, I want you to know two things. One, you have that love too. You need to know that no matter how you look at yourself or how other people look at you, you are loved and valued and treasured by God. You are a special creation of God, each one of you. You are created in God's image, just like all of us, and you are filled with God's holy breath, just like all of us. And number two, you can make other children feel that very same way. You can make them feel loved and accepted. You can be a friend when they have none. You can include them when they feel like they're on the outside. You can stop people making fun of other children and speak kindly to them and be kind to them. That's very powerful. Remember Zacchaeus this week when you're at school. Remember, just like Zacchaeus, God loves you. Amen. Now, how do I get down from here? him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee. Lord of life, who triumphed 
Amen. The scripture reading this morning will be taken from Luke 19, 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed the sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Amen. So this morning, we continue our series of messages on the beloved community. We've talked about what defines the beloved community, what things are a part of the beloved community. We've talked about things that are not part of the beloved community. And and now we're talking about um, perfectly imperfect is the best way that I can describe those who make up the beloved community. And this is a way for us to take a look at uh, the various characters uh, in the Bible, uh, especially those surrounding Jesus and, and whose lives were were touched by his ministry, his love, his care, and how he invited them into being part of the beloved community, being part of a larger life offered to the world. We've talked about Peter and Mary Magdalene and Levi. We've talked about the woman caught in adultery. And today, uh, we're going to talk about a very special character, Zacchaeus. And we have a wonderful presentation by Jerry Ross that will be presented to you now. Have you ever walked into a room and you knew that nobody wanted you? That you were unwanted, unworthy, unliked, unloved? That was every day of my life. No one talked to me. They whispered behind my back. They never smiled at me, or most of them cursed as I walked by. I mean, no surprise, I was public enemy number one. They were right to hide their public lives from me because all I wanted from them was their money. All I wanted from them was whatever I could get that would help me and hurt them. But all that changed one day, forever. I had never met him, but I'd heard of him. The streets were buzzing with the news that Jesus was coming to town. I had always heard his name with such wonder that it filled my heart. Jesus, he healed the sick, he tamed the waves, he made the the dead come back to life. He even talked to tax collectors, like me. I knew this. A guy I knew, Matthew, he was a tax collector, just like I was. And now he followed Jesus. Jesus let him follow him. He invited him to follow him. A tax collector, a nobody, like me. I guess it was hope that took me there that day. Hope that I might just get a chance to see him. Maybe catch a glimpse of him. I was hoping to see something, maybe in his eye or in the way that he walked. The day that he was set to come to Jericho, I I joined the crowds. They were all out there gathered in the streets, and I thought that I could stand among the people and see the man that everyone else in the crowd gathered to see. But it was obvious no one was going to help me. The crowds were long and wide and and high, and 
I'm short. I couldn't see anything. And so the masses wouldn't let me through and wouldn't let me move to the front. So in fact, they pushed me back and I ended up at further and further back. So out of sight of anything, it was impossible. And I thought I should have known. I mean, what was I thinking? See Jesus? What right did I have to even hope to see Jesus? I could feel the crowd around me thinking the same thing too. They didn't want me there. Their eyes mirrored what I was thinking in my head. So I just stopped fighting for a place. I moved away from the crowds and I still wanted to see him though. I looked around and I, I saw a sycamore tree and it had low branches. I mean, branches that I could climb. I could see over the crowds and, and it was far enough away that I could hide and no one would have to see me. And it was close enough that I could see Jesus as he was walking by. So I climbed up into that tree and I waited. Well, I, I hid actually until he finally came. And the people were cheering and I kept quiet even though every part of me wanted to shout but I didn't want to be seen. And then I was seen by the man himself. He had just reached a spot in the road by my little tree and I thought, I did it, I saw it. And just as I thought he was gonna pass, he stopped and he looked up at me in that tree. I tried to hide, but he found me. I froze, but it was clear he saw me. And he didn't keep walking. He just stood there for a moment, looking up at me, this man that I had never met, never even seen before that day, called me by my name. He knew my name. And I knew if he knew my name, then he must know everything about me. Every lie I had ever told and every dollar I had ever cheated, ever hope that I had had that became hopeless. And he didn't keep walking. He found me and he called me by name. And there, as the crowd around him wondered in awe that he had even spoken to me, Jesus said he was coming to my house, my home. He said he was going to stay with me. I had just wanted the honor of seeing him. And he honored me by really seeing me. And that day, that very day that I met Jesus, my life changed. How could it not? I mean, Jesus never asked me to change. He just saw me. And being sinned by him made me see myself and how I was living only for myself. Now I would live for others, for him. I gave everything away to the poor. I paid back four times the amount of money that I had cheated from my neighbors. Jesus found me when I was lost and he called me by name. He called me a son of Abraham. And when he said that, he was telling me that I was worthy. I was wanted and I was loved and that I didn't have to hide away in a sycamore tree anymore. I want to thank Jerry for that very moving uh, presentation uh, of Zacchaeus. It's always neat to be able to see the story told from different perspectives and in uh, different venues. We get a fuller picture of what it might be, uh, its meaning and its purpose in the Gospels for us. And I think one of the things about Zacchaeus uh, in terms of the picture of being perfectly imperfect is that we know very well that Zacchaeus was considered an outsider for a variety of reasons. Number one, he was um, probably the first thing, his short stature. He was a little guy. And in our world, People can find all kinds of things, little imperfections to pick at each other, to lift up and make fun of each other, and in some ways to bully each other. How sad 
that truth is. And, and so many of us have at one time or another been on the wrong end of that kind of making fun by people because we all carry some imperfection. We've all made some kind of silly mistake that other people jumped at the chance to lift up and to put us down, make fun of us. Sometimes it was got done good naturedly, but I really wondered if that's ever possible, there's always a little bit of stinging seriousness uh, as part of those put-downs. It's sad. But he was also ostracized because of his occupation, being a tax collector employed by the Romans to extract money from his own people, own Jewish people that they could see Zacchaeus had a good job. He made a good salary, a living wage, and he did well for himself. And probably Zacchaeus took advantage of collecting taxes from time to time and required more than what was fair. You see this back and forth for Zacchaeus. We, we don't know much about his life previous to this, but you, you can almost fill in the blank, can't you? Uh, from the time he was a young boy, he was smaller than other children. But thinking that potentially he would grow to be just like the others, he had hope until... As time went on, the reality of his situation came into clear focus. Zacchaeus was going to be short. He wasn't going to be like the other children. He would always be the smallest one in the group. And over time, you can imagine that others saw this as an opportunity to build themselves up because they could pick on the shortcoming of another person. They could feel better about themselves because at least they weren't short, right? And you can imagine that over time that war um, and rubbed Zacchaeus the wrong way. Well, you know what happens to people when you take that, that kind of abuse over a period of time, you start to plot on how can you get back at them? How can you make them f feel the same hurt that you feel? And so in retribution, Zacchaeus would get back at them because he was a smart guy. He did have brains, and there were probably other children who weren't quite as smart as he was. And he could make fun of them, which only made it worse. They're putting him down. And you can imagine over time, this back and forth got to the point where when Zacchaeus became a tax collector, he wanted to stick it to the people who made his life miserable. He wanted them to know how bad it felt. And if they were going to make fun of him, they were at least going to pay for it, right? But Zacchaeus had an emptiness within him that nothing could fill up. No matter how much money he made, no matter how many possessions he had, and he had quite a few, no matter how well he was dressed, no matter how big a house he lived in, there was still this gnawing hole in him because none of it provided for him what he really, really wanted, what he hungered for since he was a young boy. Acceptance, inclusion, being brought in and embraced by the group. The hurt and the pain of him being an outsider for so long was deep. And he tried to fill it up with those things, and he tried to fill it up by making other people feel the same hurt and pain that he experienced, but none of it was satisfying. 
And so one day he heard that this man named Jesus was going to be walking through town. And, and he wanted to look. He wanted to see for himself. He had heard the stories that other people told about how he could heal, how he could express God's love, how he could make things right in people's lives, make them whole. And that's what he wanted. Maybe, just maybe, he could make him grow some to be taller. And that day, just like any other parade, he could not see because people didn't make room for him. And they pushed him to the back to where he couldn't see over them as Jesus was coming by. But he was smart. He saw a sycamore tree down the lane a bit and decided that he could climb that tree and he could get a look. To his astonishment, as he looked at Jesus walking along, he could see here was a man who had compassion. But how surprised he was when Jesus stopped. And he looked up in the tree and he called Zacchaeus by his name. He didn't say, hey, runt, hey, shorty. He called him by his name, Zacchaeus. Come down from the tree. I'm going to have dinner at your house. Now, Jesus didn't lay hands on Zacchaeus and somehow made him grow taller. He didn't change anything about his life on the outside anyway, but calling him by his name and saying that he would be honored to be a visitor at his house. That's all it took. Because Zacchaeus, for the first time in a long time, felt accepted and he felt included. And that made all the difference for him. He finally found that which would fill the hole inside of him, that which would fill the hunger that he had for so many years. And experiencing that had this incredible effect that he was able to proclaim, Lord, if, if I've defrauded anyone, I want to make amends. And I will not only pay them back, but I'll pay them back four times. I want to make things right. So here, in the acceptance of Jesus, he finds that welcome, that embrace, that being part of and, and included in a larger community. And it changes his life. I think about the people in our world who have tried to become part of the beloved community, but they've been rejected for one reason or another. You know, it wasn't that long ago that churches were built a couple of stories that somehow you had to have, they, 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 you had to climb some steps in, in order to get into the church. Well, you know who that excluded? Without ever saying, we don't want you here, those steps said, we don't want you here if you can't climb the steps. So if you were in a wheelchair, if you found it difficult to walk, you couldn't be part of the beloved community. Now, I don't think anybody intentionally wanted to exclude people who were physically challenged, but that was the effect, that was the result. The same way with people who have any kind of mental um, challenge or disability, who have some kind of emotional situation in which makes them different, act different, be different. 
The church has had ways of saying, you're not welcome here. And this, it wasn't that long ago when people who were divorced would not be welcome at the church because they didn't fit. They didn't fit the ideal image that people had about the church where you were married and you did things right and 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 so you were included but if you had problems don't come if you've been divorced don't come if you had broken relationships whether it was your fault or not don't come and sadly we've extended that to our brothers and sisters in the LGBTQ community. You don't fit. You're not like us. The way we read the Bible defines that we're on the inside and you're on the outside. Zacchaeus represents Jesus' embrace Jesus' inclusion of people who are different. You are not only welcome here, but you will be a great part of living out the love of God to the world. You're a necessary part. You're a vital part because you, no matter what your life circumstance is, you are loved and valued and treasured by God. And so the beloved community, the church, following in the way of Jesus, throws open our arms to people of all walks of life who have felt excluded, pushed away, not welcome. But now, come, as Jesus said. Come, you who are weary and heavily laden, you who are burdened, come. Put my yoke upon you. It's not burdensome. It's inclusive. Come and be a part of my life and love in this world for you too are created in God's image. You too are filled with God's holy breath. You too are a child of God. Irreplaceable expression of God's love in this world. Amen.
So this morning, we continue our series of messages on the beloved community. We've talked about what defines the beloved community, what things are a part of the beloved community. We've talked about things that are not part of the beloved community. And, and now we're talking about um, perfectly imperfect is the best way that I can describe those who make up the beloved community. And this is a way for us to take a look at uh, the various characters uh, in the Bible, uh, especially those surrounding Jesus and, and whose lives were, were touched by his ministry, his love, his care, and how he invited them into being part of the beloved community, being part of a larger life offered to the world. We've talked about Peter and Mary Magdalene and Levi. We've talked about the woman caught in adultery. And today, uh, we're going to talk about a very special character, Zacchaeus. And we have a wonderful presentation by Jerry Ross that will be presented to you now. 